Hey guys, it's Alexander Williamson here with the secret history inside your aquarium or barrels full of fish, whatever you're working with today. So today was the hottest day in Seattle history. It was 114 degrees in certain parts of the city. And why does it vary depending on the part of the city you're in? Well, there's microclimates. For one, Seattle has 500, 600 feet in elevation, 200 meters or so, all the way down to sea level, and lots of bodies of water, lakes, uh, the salt water in the Puget Sound, and it has a lot of green belts. It has a lot of trees and things, whereas it also has a downtown corridor and a business district and freeways, airports, runways, you know, things that are very uniform and uh, dense. And when we're talking about heat island and heat retention, cities actually retain somewhere between 1.5 and 5 degrees Fahrenheit more heat than the natural setting in an area. This can be the most pronounced, like the five degrees, when we're talking about something like uh, a jungle or a desert where you're, you're near the equator, the sun is very intense, and you've deforested a rainforest, for instance. You're going to see a huge difference. And what I want to show you guys next is just a quick example. So we've got some gravel over here. The sun set about, oh, I don't know, two hour and a half ago it disappeared. Uh, over the horizon and over here we're starting to see things cooling down 85 86 uh, on this gravel no coverage really from the Sun but it is broken up it's not one mass of 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 uh, material whereas this cinder block for instance is one chunk of material so it's gonna be a little warmer same probably same with the house here yep and this all was in the same shadow so we're working kind of equally here yet wood a little cooler than the side of the vinyl on the house. So it also depends on what the materials are. Organic materials tend to be very porous when you look at them closely, and they tend to wick water on them. So whether that's wood or even just rocks over time, little channels form, little micro fissures and cracks form, and the water is able to flow, move, and also stay trapped in these little areas. And that all affects how something heats up or cools down. So let's take a look now as we're moving. Pretend this is the big paved parking lot. And you know how hot blacktop is when you're... I mean, you've probably felt this yourself on a hot day. Blacktop, asphalt, or concrete roads. And then you get onto the grass. And boom, it's 10 degrees cooler on the grass. Not even 6 inches away. And when we get all the way down into things and underneath the layers of these canopies, um, if this were a forest and we were looking at things, things get quite a bit cooler as we work our way down. So we can see 70, 77, 78, 76. Ooh, we did have a one weird, eight, oh, I think the 81 was just an error. But, so we're 10 degrees cooler down here. And partially... There's some moisture down here. There's that. But mostly what's going on are these plants and the surface area. Unlike buildings, which are a big block that stores energy almost like a battery or a hot potato in the oven that's one uniform thing, uh, you have much more varied surface area, much more complex textures. And you've got a lot more surface area overlapping. So... Even though you see all these leaves, if we were to rip all these leaves off and put them flat, they would cover far more than the area they're in. They would probably cover, you know, three to four times that area before we reach the ground. So these are all different layers that can absorb the heat and reflect it off. Now, the ambient air heat, they're going to still, it's still going to move through and you're still going to get whatever you're going to get. The only difference being that in a real forest or jungle, you actually are going to get cooling because of evaporation and evaporative cooling. So let's look at this aquarium as it applies to our aquariums too. And we can see here that where there's solid plants and things like that, one, it will protect the water from getting warm quicker, 
because we've got this layer that needs to heat up first and then the heat can radiate through, but it will hold that heat longer, if that makes sense. So when we have open water, it allows for evaporative cooling. We can get a breeze or something blowing over the water. These are Madaka rice fish. They made it to 102 degrees Fahrenheit today, 38 degrees or so, uh, 30, 38 and a half degrees uh, Celsius. And I was looking in this bucket here and I was curious and it's 84, 85 degrees Fahrenheit rather than the you know, 86, 87 that we get over here. I think we were getting 88 also too. So, but in any case, it's because this is cooler because look at all those layers in there. It insulated it and protected it. Now, once this whole thing heats up, so if the whole world's heating up or if for weeks on end, you have a sustained heat wave or your fish room's hot, Nothing in the world is going to stop the heat from eventually getting in other than a pocket of air or some sort of material that's resistant to heat. And you can both reflect it by having light versus dark material and water actually can work both ways. It reflects heat as almost like a mirror does and it can look black, it can look dark and it can actually absorb quite a bit of uh, heat. So it depends on the optics of the day and that gets way more complicated. But the main thing I want to talk about is the evaporative cooling that can happen. So earlier today, the water was all the way up here and I added five gallons to this 20 gallon tank, probably, uh, where the white water, uh, hard water line is, is about 17 gallons out of the 20. And the other thing you'll see too is where we have exposed wood, it should be cooler, yeah, 84. It should be wicking up the water and the heat away from the pond. So whereas in the pond, the water should be fairly uniform temperature because the heat's radiated down in there, um, it's also able to evaporate off. And when it evaporates off, what's happening is water molecules actually take energy to break loose unless they're at the point of boiling, which is so much energy that they're moving around and breaking apart and flying off that they turn into steam. And for everything you go from ice or solid to uh, liquid to gas to plasma, each of those states requires a huge jump in energy. And so at the point in which you have the evaporative cooling, that's when you have a solid usually, or with water, when you have water below the boiling point, it takes a fair bit of energy because water is a polar molecule. So the water will try to stick together, but every once in a while, breeze will blow over it, add enough energy to the system that it bumps off some of the molecules that aren't the closest bonds or that may have um, some sort of debris or sediment maybe there's a plant in between them and the rest of the water and so they're just more prone to breaking off and slowly the surface evaporates away and this is evaporative cooling it's why putting a fan over pretend there's no greenery on here putting a fan over that is the most effective way to cool it uh, as well as a fountain where you're turning over that instead of having one solid brick that's like a hot potato, it's like smashing up the potato and letting the steam all come out and mixing it around is what your aeration and fountain is doing. And then the, the blowing on it is just like blowing on something hot when you're eating it. It cools it down by pushing that energy away. You're actually adding energy to the system, but not in radiant energy. You're adding, you're adding potential energy to take away that from it. And when we're talking about heat islands, in the city or over a lake or whatnot, the lakes in my area are like 90 degrees Fahrenheit today. The fish were literally gasping the last few days at the top of the water. It was really sad. Many probably died. Salmon are definitely dying in the rivers and creeks because they're not used to this temperature. And this does happen in nature too, you know, just out far from any development. But when we get these areas that are forested, you have all that surface area of different little solid states of leaves in the form of trees and thousands and thousands of little pieces. And they're going to actually break up that heat. And just as they're easier, they're easier to heat up, they cool off easier too. This apple's probably hotter. Yep. See, it's bigger. The mass is bigger. 
it sat in the sun the same amount of time. But since the surface area is so much smaller on leaves, we get the leaves cooling off much quicker. And the leaves that are, that are out far from the tree cool off the quickest. So when we're looking at our, our forest or our wetland or grassland, what happens also is that heat rises over the city where it's up to five degrees hotter because hot air rises. We remember that probably from school. And that air is then also usually saturated with any evaporation that happened. And so this is why we get both at mountain ranges or at the end of a city. So if we're looking at this yard and we say that um, the dry spots are cities that are paved and there's little houses. I mean, we're way scaled out like this is a whole state. And that's a big forest, national forest, and over here's another one. We're going to get the most rain if the winds, if the weather's moving this way. The most rain will fall here. It'll also fall wherever there's mountains because pushing it up, only so much moisture can be carried so high in the air, and then it has to be released. But with lakes and forests, this heat island effect, the cities stay very, very hot. They then cause air drafts to make air rise way up over uh, the usual amount. Five degrees is huge on an average day for no apparent reason in one spot for the air to just, the column to be hotter because you've got all these, you know, asphalt roofs or you've got glass and you've got metal and you've got concrete and these, these structures and things that are not porous. They're not uh, layered in sort of tiles usually or in canopy layers like like you see with trees i mean look how many layers of leaves we have and then we've got an area underneath it to be shaded and so there's whole ecosystems when we we talk about a rainforest and a river or something you'll have a tree coming over a river and it gets all all of this gets compounded by other factors so things like when we're looking at our city uh down here our city planning and we've got our forest and we've got the brown areas of the city remember the other thing that happens is that loses its its liquid. That loses its water, its ground, its topsoil, and you, you get dust. And then, you know, people will try to work that soil like it happened during the Dust Bowl, and they'll, they'll try to till that soil without adding enough moisture, without adding more roots and plants back to the area, without adding big trees with deep roots. They're just adding monocultures or one even consistency of stuff. A cornfield from the air will probably all kind of be the same temperature. A soybean field will probably be the same temperature. So if you have a one uniform thing, just like even a forest, it helps keep it one temperature. And even if that thing's diverse, like a forest, where you've got a bunch of different trees and textures, the temperature will just be cooler, but it will have kind of a consistent area temperature. And so as that air is moving through and we're saying it's going this way that dust is going to rise it's going to get picked up with wind and as that hot air is lifting it has to pull air from somewhere so it's either going to pull air equally from all around and that's going to be a low pressure point where my finger is up in the yay yay uh, high above the yard you know miles above the earth and that's going to cause updrafts well then those updrafts freeze when they're up high and and or the particles of sand and dust go up and they get kicked around and they float around in the upper atmosphere and they give us hazy nights like this and they give us you know things like smoke and pollution also add to this as well but that's what water forms around water will not form droplets completely on its own it will need a nucleation point and it finds that with this and especially with the particles and the, the pollution over a city and between the heat causing these vortexes of wind and these different currents we actually get shadows so you may have an area where right here on the other side of a city um, you know where it's really dry no rain falls whatsoever and it's just all desert because it got so much higher in the atmosphere that before it fell and then it fell down farther than the natural tendency of how that area has been. And when you have an area that has mountain ranges, rivers, and floodplains, there's a certain way that water has moved for eons. And when it actually moves, even if it's, say, 5% or 10% or 20% different, which you can get in temperature variation, 
and in height of particles accelerating up into the atmosphere, that water then is going to rain farther away from the dry city areas here in our analogy. And the jungle areas and things are going to even attract more moisture. And mountains as well, which rise up, they're going to cause the moisture to be squeezed out of the air because it can't, it can only go so high. And then gravity says, nope, you got to come back down. And so it, that's why on, on mountains you get snow and rain is because it, it rings the clouds out as they can't go any higher. They can't carry any more of the liquid that they're already saturated and carrying. And so this can have big implications for flooding and things where you've got a city over here and all the water used to fall all right here on this natural forest that we were talking about, right? This cooler area. Well, now it dumps down here and now we've got a wetland that used to be who knows what and all that water maybe it used to flow through channels here and navigate and and it it had found a way over thousands and thousands of years well over 50 or 100 or 150 years of human t time it hasn't found a way yet from the deforestation from the the heat islands and so when it falls it's going to flood those low-lying areas over there. It's going to find new river channels. It's going to cause mudslides. It will reshape it eventually. And if we kept that constant, it might not be a problem. It might actually just reshape and there you go. It's no big deal. But with the ever-changing nature of what we do to the earth, it's just always changing rainfall amounts and where we're seeing that. And it's why you'll see rainfall right at the edge of a city oftentimes and not in the center of the city as much. I'm not saying it doesn't, but you'll see that or you'll see it just south or north or east or west of a city because you get this effect of all this moisture and saturated air and it's cooler and the air that's cool wants to settle and it stays cooler and then as soon as it gets here over the dry area again the hotter area it's going to lift right away it's going to rip apart from the air moisture and it's going to then carry it as far as it can it'll either dissipate or in hot air it can actually carry more humidity that's why when it's humid and it's hot out it feels so much hotter than when it's cold and humid out and then it moves along, it floats along, and it can actually just stay in the air and never come down uh, anytime soon, which is a whole other problem because then we get a desertification caused by the city and you end up with dry, dead areas. Now, that's, I don't pretend that that's what's going on in, in my, my driveway, but I wanted to bring up some of the like ideas and thoughts of what's at play here when we get these heat islands, when we get desertification, when we deforest an area. And then when you get rid of the roots, you get rid of all the stuff holding in the, the banks of the river. You get silt going into the river, the river gets murky, all of a sudden you've got mud and solid particles in the river. Those heat up much quicker than just water that's crystal clear and moving. And pretty soon you get you know the algae blooms if you have nitrates from farming or from pollution phosphorus ammonia things like that from industrial and agricultural use then it just sucks the air it sucks the the o2 and it sucks a lot of the nutrients and things out of the water uh, from their usable forms now there may be too much nutrients and then you get a bloom of algae or you get a bloom of bacteria and that can also be bad but all this can stem from just getting rid of the trees that you know do so much work for us and we don't often thank i mean they even slow down the winds that move through on surface level um they really do control the climate a lot and when we think about the surface of our aquarium whether that's stones whether that's plants that are immersed or floating they can impact our evaporative cooling rate a whole lot too so just something to think about for you guys today and I'm sure a lot of you guys know a lot more instances where this is the case, where there's other nuances going on, and I'd love to hear about it if, if you want to bring those up in the comments. Um, but just something to think about, something I was thinking about today when I was thinking, man, it's hot. How could I cool off the tanks most effectively? And what am I doing that's counterproductive rather than productive uh, in some of those cases? You know, I think I'm helping, but then it realized... Actually, I just gave it more surface area to heat up evenly, you know. 
or it traps the heat in the day. So the idea would be cover it in the day, then uncover it at night, you know? Um, if only nature had that luxury, it would sure be nice, uh, but it doesn't. So we need to stop deforestation before it gets to that point. All right, guys, I've talked plenty, uh, and I hope you guys have a cool night. Hope you guys have a chill night. And uh, let's see here. Did I just flash myself in the eye? I'm at a cool 92 because I have sweat, which is evaporative cooling, and we are a mammal that does that. Fish don't sweat, so uh, they have to cool themselves by regulating liquids coming and going from their body, and they're cold-blooded anyways, usually. So, a uh, whole different story for another show. But us being mammals, I hope you're sweating if it's hot, and uh, I hope it's evaporating and air's moving over you and it feels nice and cool. Talk to you guys later.